Part 4. Implementation of the Therapy Chapter 1. The Twofold Movement of Inner Conversion Praxis The conversion of man's powers, faculties, energies, and motions, by which the transition from the sickness of the passions to the health of the virtues is brought about, is accomplished in two simultaneous movements. The first consists in turning all these faculties away from evil, in other words, in ceasing to misuse them and extracting them from carnal realities. The second consists in turning them towards spiritual realities and inserting them into the reality of God. This twofold movement counteracts the twofold movement by which man caused his fall and which is perpetuated in every sin. The movement through which he turns away from God and at the same time turns toward carnal realities. Through the mouth of the psalmist and of the holy apostle Peter, God invites man to this saving double movement, quote, depart from evil and do good, 1 Peter 3.10. St. Maximus comments, that is to say, fight the enemy in order to diminish the passions and fight to acquire the virtues. In other words, the first of these two movements consists in a detachment regarding evil, a detachment which, according to the words of St. Paul, is accomplished by the crucifixion of the flesh with its passions and desires, Galatians 5.24, or again by, quote, putting to death what is earthly, Colossians 3.5. Let us repeat, we must not understand this to be the crucifixion and mortification of the powers, faculties, and energies of the soul and body. For if they are supports and vehicles of the passions, they are also such with regard to the virtues. And this is even funda more fundamentally so, since the virtues correspond to the nature of these supports. Let us recall that the word flesh does not mean the body, but rather the law of sin, Romans 8.2, which operates in both the soul and the body of the fallen man subject to sin. What must be put to death, or rather the relationships of these powers with wicked things, it is not the means by which man commits evil and attaches himself to carnal realities that must be mortified, but rather the committing and the attachment themselves. St. Gregory Palamas notes, quote, We have not received the prescription to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires in order to kill ourselves by putting to death every bodily activity and every power of the soul, but rather in order to reject every wicked desire and action. Abba Isaiah says similarly that it is not a matter of cutting off all desires, but of cutting off the desires according to the flesh, an observation applicable to all the powers of the body and the soul. One has only to eliminate every carnal use of each of these powers and to mortify their perverse orientation toward sensible realities, sensible objects, and sensible pleasures. This orientation is precisely what constitutes the passions. Thus, the Holy Fathers often speak in the same sense of mortifying the passions or of cutting off the passions. This last expression quite naturally leads to the use of surgical imagery. Clement of Alexandria writes, quote, the passions being an ulcer on the truth must be reduced to nothing by cutting them off through amputation from his pedagogue. If man wishes to be healed of all his illnesses and attain to health and the other good things of the kingdom and reign, this operation by which man does violence to himself constitutes his primary task. Regaining health assumes, first of all, that one is fighting against whatever is changing him. Clement of Alexandria points out, quote, nothing is more urgent than separating ourselves, first of all, from the passions and illnesses. He subsequently advises, Quote, let us strive to sin as little as possible. For his part, St. Isaac the Syrian writes, quote, If it is not purified of every passion, the soul will not be healed of the illnesses of sin. Sedical Homily 86. John Moskos, of the spiritual garden, the spiritual meadow, relates the teaching of St. John of Syziscus, which, constant, which continues if Logoson, in this train of thought, quote, whoever would attain a certain virtue cannot succeed unless he first hate the vice which 
is the antithesis of that virtue, end of quote, from Spiritual Meadow. The virtues cannot appear as long as the passions occupy their place and cover them up. Indeed, as St. Isaac the Syrian explains in Ascetical Homily 68, quote, the passions are a wall in front of the hidden virtues of the soul. If they do not begin to fall down, the virtues hidden within the soul cannot themselves be seen. As no one sees the sun in darkness, neither can he see virtue in the soul as long as the torment of the passions remains in him. As the virtues correspond to man's natural state and the passions to an unnatural state, one can also say that man's return to his natural state is only possible by eliminating what is contrary to nature within him. St. Gregory of Nyssa points out that, quote, the soul's return to a state proper and natural to it is a shedding of every foreign element. Abba Isaiah writes similarly, quote, he who wishes to achieve conformity to nature cuts off all desires according to the flesh until he be established in the natural state. The various ascetical practices are all called for with this goal in mind, notes St. John Damascene from an exact exposition of the Orthodox faith. Quote, asceticism and its trials are not conceived so as to acquire virtue as if it were something extraneous, but on the contrary, so as to drive away from a man the unnatural passions that come from without. In like manner, rust is not natural to iron, but results from neglect. With a little effort, we remove it and restore the iron's natural brilliance. End of quote. Let us recall that herein also lies one of the main goals pursued by the keeping of the commandments. St. Isaac reminds us that, quote, the Savior replied to the rich man who questioned him so as to know how to inherit eternal life. Keep the commandments, Luke 10.25. And when he asked him which commandments these were, he replied, first of all, that he should distance himself from wicked things. St. Paul himself teaches that in order to be Ready for any good work, man must purify himself from what is ignoble. That in order to be able to put on the new man, the perfect, healthy, and virtuous man in Christ's likeness, he must first put off the old man, i.e. the passions, as St. Isaac notes. Put off your old nature which belonged to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new nature created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 4, to 24 Yet this first movement of spiritual conversion is not sufficient. It does not suffice to turn away from evil so as to turn toward good. St. Maximus points out, quote, If a man has cut off the passions, it does not necessarily mean that his thoughts are already oriented toward the divine. Recalling, the previously mentioned psalm, that of Psalm 36, verse 27, St. Dorotheus also emphasizes that whoever wishes to be saved must not only not do evil, but also do good. Christ sets as a condition for entering the kingdom that each man not only take up his cross, but also that he follow him. Matthew 10, 38. He himself formulates the recommendation of doing good as do the holy apostles after his example. It is in the positive orientation of all man's powers and faculties towards spiritual realities, in other words, in active practice of the virtues, that this recommendation to do good is fulfilled and the second movement of spiritual conversion is accomplished. St. Dorotheus of Gaza thus explains, quote, We have banished the virtues and introduced the passions in their place. Likewise, we must make an effort not only to drive out the passions, but also to reintroduce the virtues and reestablish them in their proper place. The two movements are complementary, not only in the sense that the second must follow the first in order that the conversion and change of direction may be completed, but also in the sense that each one allows the fulfillment of the other. We have seen that the first movement is the absolute necessary prerequisite of the second. Yet we must add that the second is also condition of the first. This can be explained through the principle of economy, which we have already set forth with regard to desire. There exists an incompatibility 
between the desire of the flesh and the desire of spiritually good things. They are mutually exclusive. As the Holy Apostle himself teaches, quote from Galatians 5.17, Romans 8.7, and Galatians 5.16, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, end of quote. This is equally true of the other powers or faculties of the soul, whose energy invested in one object becomes unavailable for another one, much less for the object's opposite. Quote, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other, Matthew 6, 24. In like manner, one can apply what St. Irenaeus says of spiritual life and death to the virtues and passions, respectively, which is all the more justified since, as we've seen, the passions are the death of the soul, whereas the virtues are its life. Quote, These things give way to one another, and both the one and the other cannot remain in the same place, but the one is cast out by the other, and by the fact that one is present, the other is destroyed, end of quote, against heresies. Thus, the passions, while they perdure, prevent the virtues from appearing. For this reason, one must fight against the former in order that the latter might arise. Conversely, the appearance of the virtues, and thus the practice of good, causes the passions to disappear. St. Irenaeus continues, quote, If then death and seizing man expelled life from him, and make him into a dead man, all the more shall life, in taking hold of man, expel death and quicken man. Evagrius thus notes that virtuous men check all the irrational passions in their bodies, and cut off the vices of the soul by their communion in the good. And St. Simeon, the New Theologian, writes, quote, To the extent that the sun rises, a shadow retreats and vanishes. Likewise, when virtue shines, malice is driven away like a shadow. End of quote, catechesis. St. Maximus, for his part, notes that, quote, When love of God dominates the intellect, it frees it from its bonds, persuading it to rise above sensible things. This corresponds to St. Paul's own teaching, quote, Walk by the Spirit, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, Galatians 5.16, which is taken up again by St. Gregory Palamas, quote, In those who have lifted their spirit to God and have exalted their soul by God's passion, the flesh no longer possesses desires contrary to the Spirit, from his triads. From this perspective, the virtues seem to be means to subjugate and expel the passions. Or, according to the corresponding medical terminology, they appear to be remedies, or more precisely, antidotes to the passions, since each passion has its corresponding and opposed virtue. See Philokalia, Volume 3, List of Passions and Virtues by St. Peter Damascus. To continue, the former is the contranatural and pathological misuse of a specific faculty or power of the soul, whereas the latter is its good, natural, and healthy use. One thus possesses the sought-for sought object through gradual exclusion of its opposite. It may seem in, inconsequent to state, as we have done, that on the one hand, the eliminations of the passions returns man to his natural state and causes the virtues to reappear, and on the other hand, that an active practice of good is necessary for acquiring the virtues. One might then ask, if the virtues are already present, why is effort still required in order to attain them? Well, let us recall that to begin with, the virtues are for man but seeds. It is up to man's free will, in collaboration with God's grace, to cultivate them within himself. They are a gift of this grace, and man's task is to integrate them into himself a task accomplished by the practice of good and the active collaboration of all his faculties in each of their activities with God's will, and through the concrete realization of the divine plan inscribed within human nature. Spiritual conversion is thus wrought in the dynamic process of growth that leads man from a state of infancy to that of the true, perfect, and mature man, attaining the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.12, 
St. Simeon the New Theologian writes, quote, Every day he pursues his spiritual growth, removing every tra tra trace of childishness and advancing towards man's fulfilled perfection. For this reason, he will see the powers and energies of his soul change according to the measure of his age. It must be stressed that this process of growth, like its underlying process of spiritual conversion, is theanthropic. It presupposes the synergy of human effort and divine grace. Throughout the preceding considerations, we have primarily emphasized the first factor. Yet one must bear in mind that if man's efforts are absolutely necessary in order for him to incorporate grace into himself, conversely, grace alone permits the fulfillment of these effort efforts. Through grace, both the purification of the passions as well as the acquisition of the virtues toward which man strives is accomplished. Through the Holy Spirit, man is renewed, purified, sanctified, and brought to perfection. In addition, St. Anthony the Great speaks of the spirit of conversion who comes to the aid of those who embark on this path and, quote, goes before so as to make light the fight and render easy the work of their conversion, who, quote, shows them the paths of bodily and inner ascesis and how to convert and abide in God, their creator who perfects their works. St. Maximus likewise calls to mind this activity of the Holy Spirit to his, from his questions to Thalassius. First of all, he teaches them to desire the mortification of their inclination to sin, as well as the mortification of deliberate sin. Then he teaches them to desire in themselves the restoration of the disposition toward virtue, as well as the restore, restoration of deliberate virtue. Consequently, he teaches them to seek the means to attain this, that is, that which by nature is intended to bring about the mortification of sin and the resurrection of virtue. This last remark serves as an occasion for St. Maximus to recall that at the heart of in this twofold operation is man's, quote, achieving a perfect likeness to Christ's death as regards the mortification of sin, and a perfect likeness to his resurrection as regard to the fulfilling of virtue, quote, end quote, with the help of the Holy Spirit. We have seen that in holy baptism, the Holy Spirit makes man a participant in the restoration of human nature, wrought by Christ in his person as Theanthropos, Having died to sin in Christ's death, man is resurrected to virtue in his resurrection. However, it remains for man, restored to his reality of being in the image of God, to keep himself pure or to regain this purity if he has lost it, as well as to grow in Christ through the Spirit into the perfection in God to which he's called. The double movement of conversion to the divine, which by God's grace and in faith repentance, prayer, and the keeping of the Lord's commandments consists of the purification of the passions and the acquisition of the virtues. It is designated in the ascetic tradition by the term praxis or ascesis. This latter word is taken here in its broadest meaning of practice, training, and a way of action or life. Since this twofold movement always presupposes effort, even a battle or a fight against the passions and demons and for the virtues. And this is always the case. The word for battle, combat, and battle and exercise and training are also frequently used. Praxis, in its twofold as aspect, is based on the keeping of the commandments. Its beginning is faith, and its end is both dispassion, impassibility, the state in which man is healed of the passions, and perfect love. See Evagrius in Practicos. Praxis is the path of the purification of the passions to the point of their complete elimination, but also the ascent on the ladder of the virtues up to the highest rung. The fulfillment of praxis's two functions does not take place successively, but rather simultaneously, as we've seen and in some way dialectically, with each function contributing indispensably to the other's realization. Thus, the same thing occurs in both the soul and the body, 
the elimination of illness and the return to health are brought about simultaneously, the two giving rise to each other. Likewise, in the study we shall undertake of the healing of different spiritual illnesses, it will be difficult for each of us, for in each case, to dissociate the battle against the passion from the acquisition of the corresponding virtue. This is all the more so on account of an additional difficulty. We have seen that the passions are all interrelated and involve one another, each one engendering all the others. A consequence of this is that the fight against a particular passion will have to be accomplished by a fight against all the other passions, lest any one battle remain ineffectual. The passion fought on one flank will reappear on the other, having been aroused by one or several other passions to which it is linked and which have been left unassailed. As St. Gregory the Great points out, this is one of the meanings of the following passage from the book of Job. Quote, the paths of their steps turn aside. In Job 6.18, Thus I have also been deserted by all, and I am ruined and become an outcast. Which he explains thus, It is not rare that persons prepare themselves to battle against certain vices with conviction, but neglect to overcome others. In not resisting these latter, other ones, that are hidden, they will again find themselves faced with those which they are already able to surmount. Thus the vices hold on to him who wants to flee, thanks to a kind of pact of mutual assistance. One could say that they bring back under their control those whom they had lost, and pass them back and forth among themselves, so as to take revenge. Yes, for sinners... The paths of their steps turn aside. When they are able to lift a foot because they have attained to conquering a type of sins, another vice seizes power, and behold, once again, they entangle themselves in the one they had succeeded in eliminating. Just like the passions, all the virtues are also linked to each other organically. Quote, one is the power of virtue, notes Clement of Alexandria. In like manner, St. John Cassian notes, quote, All virtues have something in common, however many types and names we may distinguish. Evagrius likewise observes, quote, Virtue is one by nature, but is imitated variously by the powers of the soul. Consequently, Clement of Alexandria notes, quote, The virtues accompany each other. And Saints Callisto, St. Ignatius, Xanthopuli, One virtue depends on the other. On the other hand, on the one hand, the result of this is that to possess one virtue is in a certain way to possess them all. St. Gregory of Nyssa remarks, quote, The virtues are not isolated one from another, and it is impossible to grasp one in all that this notion implies without also attaining the others. But when one virtue enters into a person, the others necessarily follow. End of quote from On Virginity. However, this also has the result that one cannot truly possess a single virtue if one does not possess all the others, and that the weakness of a single virtue engenders, endangers all the others. Quote, each virtue taken by itself is all the weaker since the others are still missing, remarks St. Gregory of Nyssa, who continues, a virtue isolated from the others is either a virtue that does not exist or a virtue that is still quite far from perfection. St. John Climacus Opinion, quote, one who is found wanting in any part of virtue cannot pass the whole, possess the whole, no matter how great a city is, defended by high walls and strongly barred gates. If one tiny pastern is betrayed, it will be sacked. From his institutes, Evagris also gives this warning to the one starting out on the path of spiritual progress. Quote, he should take care in setting out that he not wander and become shipwrecked but should be careful to practice all the virtues equally, since they are interconnected, and the mind is often betrayed on the part of that which is deficient. End of quote. The interdependence of the virtues, like that of the passions, does not prohibit a certain sequence from being defined, both for acquiring the former as well as for combating the latter. 
we have seen that it was possible to designate among the numerous passions able to affect man eight principal or generic passions. That is, passions that are each capable of engendering a certain number of other ones and of serving as their foundation. We have shown that it is possible again to distinguish among these eight passions three even more primary ones, whence all the others proceed. And we have defined the order according to which these engender the others. Although this outline bears no absolute value in itself, nonetheless the tradition has kept it as being particularly suitable for spiritual practice. An order set down in this manner makes it possible to define tactics and strategies, which in turn prove themselves to be all the more necessary since the virtues and passions are respectively interconnected, and consequently there is always the danger of, quote, being shipwrecked by setting out without guidance into the war against the forces opposed to the virtues. Quote, it is thus necessary to wage war against the adversaries methodically, says Evagrius, and for this war it is important to know which passions must be fought first. Four basic principles may accordingly be concluded or drawn up. One, one must begin by fighting the basest passions, the ones most linked to the world and the body, whence their common title of bodily passions, and thus the most apparent ones, gluttony and lust. From these, one then proceeds to the less visible and more interior passions, finishing with those that are the subtlest and most difficult to discern in their various guises, vainglory and pride. The rationale behind this sequence is pedagogical. It progresses from what is most accessible to what is least, but above all, it is founded on the fact that it is impossible to uproot the subtlest passions if the basest bodily passions have not already been extirpated. 2. It is advisable to adhere to the following order. Gluttony, lust, love of money and greed, anger, sadness, acedia, neglect, vainglory, pride. In regard to this, St. John Cassianos writes, quote, although these eight vices then have different origins and varying operations, yet the first six, namely gluttony, fornication, avarice, anger, sadness, and acedia, are connected among themselves by a certain affinity and, so to speak, interlinking, such that the overflow of the previous one serves as the start of the next one. For from an excess of gluttony, there inevitably springs forth fornication. From fornication, avarice. From avarice, anger. From anger, sadness. And from sadness, neglect. Therefore, these must be fought against in a similar way and by the same method. And we must always attack the ones that follow by beginning with those that come before. In order to conquer acedia, sadness must be overcome. In order to drive out sadness, anger must be cast out beforehand. In order to extinguish anger, avarice must be trampled on. In order to eradicate avarice, fornication must be repressed. In order to overthrow fornication, the vice of gluttony must be disciplined. But the two remaining ones, vainglory and pride, are linked in similar fashion, like the vices that we have spoken of, such that growth in the first becomes the start of the second, for an overflow of vainglory begets the beginnings of pride. In this series, as in the preceding one, each vice then, since it is a begotten by an increase in the one that comes before it is purged away when the one before it is diminished. Therefore, vainglory must be suffocated in order for pride to be driven out. End of quote from conference number 5.10. To continue, number three. Meanwhile, we have seen that if these eight principal vices disturb the whole human race, nonetheless they do not assail everyone in the same way. As a result, however, St. John Cassian, after laying out the above-mentioned principles, points out the following. Quote, the same battle plan is not observed in each one of us, 
since, as we have mentioned, we are not all attacked in the same way. Each one of us must throw himself into the fray with an eye to the particular manner in which he is being assaulted, such that one has to fight first against the vice that is placed third, and other against that which is placed fourth or fifth. And to the degree that these vices gain the ascendancy in us and demand different strategies, we ourselves must draw up battle plans. End of quote, conferences five. Number four, among the eight generic passions, there are three fundamental passions that give birth to the first five, to wit, gluttony, love of money, and vainglory. It is necessary that these be eliminated in order that the remaining ones might also be eliminated. St. John Climacus teaches, quote, He who has piously destroyed within him the three passions has destroyed the five, too. But he who has been negligent about the former will not conquer even one passion. End of quote. Ladder, step 26. The sequence defined by these four principles must be understood less as a chronological order than a log as a logical one. It is not a question of fighting each passion in succession while neglecting those that come afterward. For we have seen that given the organic link that exists between the passions, such combat against a single passion in isolation would in the end prove to be vain. One must conduct the battle by assaulting all the passions, but by insisting more on the most fundamental ones, those that condition the others and prevent them from being seriously wounded, inasmuch as the fundamental ones themselves have not at all diminished. The radical character of St. John Climacus' above-mentioned formula has above all the goal of making one understand that it is of little use to attack the desirative passions if one is not first fought against their leaders. But we must not forget that the passions, far from being conquered in one fell swoop, are only destroyed after being assailed as a whole and being progressively weakened in the course of an always lengthy battle. As for the acquisition of the virtues, this follows the same order as the fight against the passions, since as we have seen, the former corresponds to the latter. This sequence, like that of the passions, progresses from those that are easiest to obtain to those that are most difficult. St. Isaac explains, quote, The virtues succeed one another, so that following their path might not be too heavy a burden for us, and so that we might attain them in due course, Sedical Homily 46. But this is not the only reason. The same principle that applies to the passions also applies to the virtues. Each virtue leads to the next. Quote, every virtue is the mother of the one that follows, Isaac the Syrian ascetical homily 68. To acquire the derivative virtues without first seeking to obtain the principal ones once they proceed is useless, and as St. Isaac the Syrian stresses, can even be harmful. Quote, if you neglect the mother who bore the virtues, and if you depart in search of the daughters before discovering their mother, these virtues will be as vipers in your soul. Ascetical Homily 68 again. This order, like that of the passions, is less chronological than logical, and far from ruling out that the virtues must be practiced simultaneously, only wishes to stress priorities. Understood in this way, such an order allows one to define a ladder of the virtues each virtue corresponding to a step, all of which gradually leading man to the summit of his spiritual development. St. John Climacus notes, quote, The holy virtues are like Jacob's ladder, for the virtues leading from one to another bear him who chooses them up to heaven. The ladder of divine ascent, step nine. Just as the passions cannot be conquered by one blow, so too, Quote, the soul does not reach the summit in one leap. It is led through successive stages to the heights of virtue. Our progress thus occurs in degrees, as St. Gregory the Great notes. Calling to mind this word of the psalmist, they will go forth from strength to strength. Psalm 83, verse 7. In sum, praxis 
thus appears to us to constitute a true method, both regarding the knowledge of the nature and sequence of the passions, and the manner of fighting them, in which it is also presented as a therapeutic method, properly speaking. As well as regarding the knowledge of the nature and sequence of the virtues in the manner of their practice. St. John Cassian notes, quote, practical perfection exists in a twofold form. Its first mode is that of knowing the nature of all the vices and the method of remedying them. The second is that of discerning the sequence of the virtues and forming our mind by their perfection. Conference number 24. Having already presented a nos the nosography and seminology of the passions, it remains for us to present the therapeutic model as well as the means of returning to the health of the virtues and consequently of leading these to their fullness in God. End of chapter 1. Chapter 2. Outline of the therapy of the fundamental faculties of the soul. Implementation of the generic virtues. 1. Introduction. With all the passions resulting from the illness of the soul's three primary powers, more precisely from the perversion of their diverse functions, a spiritual therapy must consist in returning these fundamental faculties to order. By returning them to a use in conformity with their nature, man recovers health. As St. Nicetus Stathato stresses, quote, If when aroused and active, a man's insensitive, appetitive, and intelligent powers spontaneously operate in accordance with nature, they make him wholly godlike and divine, sound in his actions and never in any way dislodged from nature's bedrock. This return to order is brought about by the acquisition of the totality of the virtues, but in first place in the so-called principal or generic virtues. These virtues are called such not in the sense that they might engender all the other virtues, but because they are the prerequisites for acquiring the latter, constituting a quasi-foundation for the entire spiritual edifice which the virtues must form. The healing of the soul's desirative part begins to occur with the virtue of temperance or self-control, that of the irascible part with the virtue of courage, and that of the rational and intelligent part with the virtue of prudence or discernment. The fathers often add to these three generic virtues a fourth, namely righteousness, which, quote, produces a certain harmony and symphony among the various parts of the soul. 2. Temperance We have seen how man, through sin, has turned his desirative power away from God so as to direct it toward the sensible world, seeking out sensual pleasure instead of the spiritual delights intended for him by his Creator. We have also seen how many passions and illnesses of the soul proceed from this perversion of the desirative power and its attachment to sensual pleasure. The soul's healing entails that man must follow the opposite path, that he turn his desirative power away from sensible objects and back toward God, that he correlatively detach himself from sensual pleasures and regain the spiritual delights befitting his nature. In this therapeutic process, allowing the desirative power and all its dependent faculties to function again according to their true nature and normal end goal. In other words, allowing them to regain health. The virtue of temperance plays a key role. St. Basil the Great considered it as, quote, the beginning of the spiritual life. And St. Hezekias the priest notes in its regard, quote, someone else wise in the things of God has said that as the fruit begins with the flower, so the practice of the ascetic life begins with self-control. Evagrius likewise attributes great importance to this virtue, place, even placing it on the same level as charity and love. This is understandable if one knows the essential place the desirative power holds among men's faculties and the fundamental role it plays in the process of man's fall as well as salvation. The virtue of temperance essentially consists in a mastery of the desirative power, 
which first of all is characterized by the inhibition of carnal, impassioned, and sensual desires, and by the corresponding abstention from the pleasures linked to them. In its most immediate and narrow s sense, temperance is the mastery of the body's impassioned desires. This is the virtue manifested by the apostle when he reveals, quote, I pommel my body and subdue it, 1 Corinthians 9.27. The body's passionate desires are essentially those concerning nutrition and sexuality, to which are respectively related the passions of gluttony and lust, which the fathers call the passions of the body. Speaking more generally, these are the passions entailing the physical senses. Temperance, however, is not limited to the bodily sphere. Understood in a broader sense, it is furthermore the mastery of the soul's passionate desires, which form part of the composite of almost all other passions. Thus, St. Basil writes, quote, One must not think of temperance in only one way. One must further consider it in all the evil desires that the soul can experience. End of quote. St. John Chrysostom teaches similarly, Temperance consists in not allowing oneself to be carried away by any passion. Thus, generally speaking, one can say with St. Hermas that temperance consists in abstaining from every perverse desire. For more, see the Shepherd of Hermas, Visions 3. Correlatively, temperance consists in abstaining from every unreasonable pleasure, i.e., sensual pleasures naturally linked to passionate desires. If this virtue concerns, first of all, the pleasures experienced by the body, primarily in relation to gluttony and lust, nonetheless temperance is not limited to these. Rather, it concerns the pleasures experienced by the soul in relation to all the other passions eager for pleasure. For this reason, St. Basil advises, quote, As regards what is of the passions of the soul, there is but one rule to fix temperance to, the complete renunciation of all these passions which incline towards guilty pleasure. One must note that temperance is applicable to all the bodily or mental manifestations able to respond to passionate desires and their quest for pleasure. The virtue thus aims at mastering bodily impulses, but also and above all, thoughts and fantasies. Temperance then takes the form of, quote, vigilance over the soul, as much as it does of vigilance over the body. To say that the goal of temperance is to mortify the desirative power does not mean, as we have seen, that it is necessary to eliminate every form of desire and renounce the use of the desirative power altogether. Rather, it is a matter of eliminating only the passionate desires and of renouncing every contranatural and thus perverse use of the desirative power. Furthermore, to abstain from pleasure does not mean to renounce every delight, but rather to abstain only from sensual pleasure. In like fashion, to mortify the body means only to put to death the passions supporting these tendencies. Quote, the refusal in opposition to the body, as St. Basil defines temperance, is not the refusal of the body, for example, ignoring or disdaining it, but rather the refusal of being attached to it passionately. As St. Gregory recalls in commenting on St. Paul, Romans 7.24, quote, The body is not a bad thing. The apostle shows that he does not blame the flesh, but the desire that has arisen on account of the fall. When St. Basil further defines temperance as the renouncing of pleasant things, he understands by this the renouncing not of the things themselves, but of the sensual pleasure which one is likely to take in them. If it is fitting to refuse all sensual pleasure, this is by reason of the essential relationship sin bears to it. We have seen that if man uses his faculties in a manner against nature, giving birth to the passions, this is because in turning away from God, he has given in to the appeal of sensual pleasure. Since, quote, almost every sin is committed for the sake of sensual pleasure. End of quote, Maximus the Confessor. The abstentation from pleasure that is realized by temperance is an absolute necessary means for fighting against sin and the passions and for eliminating them. 
St. Basil explains this in his Long Rule 17, quote, Temperance is the destruction of sin, the annihilation of the passions, the mortification of the body even into its appetites and desires, the beginning of the spiritual life, for temperance breaks it, breaks in it the thorn of sensual delight. Truly pleasure is the great lure of evil that renders us men so inclined to sin, and by which the entire soul is enticed toward death as by a hook. By not allowing oneself to be made effeminate by it, nor to be bent under its yoke, one escapes every sin thanks to temperance. End of quote. Passionate desire is only such because it strives via its object towards sensual pleasure instead of towards spiritual good things. We have seen that objects are never bad in themselves, but what is likely to be bad is the goal man pursues through them, or the use he makes of them. This is why, as St. John Cassian says, it is, matter, it is a matter less of abstaining from things themselves than of restraining with regard to them the passion, movement of passion, which leads us to sensual pleasure. St. Maximus, for his part, distinguishes between objects, their representation, and the passion attached to them. He specifies that the battle must, therefore, be solely against passion. The intellect of a man who enjoys the love of God does not fight against things or against conceptual images of them. It battles against the passions which are linked with these images. What constitutes abstinence, then, is the absence of attachment to objects, and furthermore, the absence of passion when faced with representations of them. The saint writes that temperance, quote, keep the intellect dispassionate in the face both of things and of the conceptual images we form of them. And it is a great achievement not to be attracted by things, but it is a far greater achievement to remain dispassionate in the face of both things and of the conceptual images we derive from them. The source of temperance is not having pleasure as the goal in using things. Temperance detaches desire from sensual pleasure, prevents it from being the desire for pleasure, and in general manner frees it from all its pathological investments. Yet this in no way constitutes either an end in itself or the ultimate goal of temperance. First of all, the goal of temperance is to master desire, to regain possession of it, to submit it to reason, to subordinate it and restore it to order. This is why the word is also translated as self-mastery. If temperance frees desire from its relegation to the flesh and puts an end to its impassioned use, it does this in order to bring back to desire its normal end goal, which is in conformity both to its nature and to reason. And in this end, as the term suggests, to the logos. In other words, temperance frees desire so as to reorient it and channel it definitively toward God and the delight in spiritually good things, in which delight God causes the man who unites himself to him to, to, to participate. Clement of Alexandria thus states, quote, Temperance is only virtuous inasmuch as it is inspired by love of God, and we embrace temperance by love for the Lord. St. Basil stresses in the same vein that if, according to the above-mentioned definition, temperance is the refusal in opposition to the body, it is conversely the adherence given to God. As we have already noted, the healing of the soul's desirative power is affected by its conversion. St. Maximus thus explains the process of this conversion. After the devil had convinced man to divert his desire from what was permitted to what was forbidden, that is, toward the original and generic passion of self-love. It was necessary that the con concusable power, unaffected by egotistical love, direct its desire toward God alone. Moreover, after recalling the process of the fall of the human faculties, he notes the role temperance plays in the, their return to virtuous use. Quote from Four Centuries on Charity. When the body is urged by the senses to indulge in its own desires and pleasures, the corrupted noose readily succumbs in a sense to its impassioned fantasies and impulses. But the regenerated noose exercises self-control and withholds itself from them, 
Moreover, as a true philosopher, it studies how to rectify such impulses. End of quote. Temperance then recovers in some measure the desired of power's energy, which has been squandered in the passions of the body and soul in its search for pleasure, making this energy serve to acquire spiritual goods. Thus, St. Maximus notes with regard to the body that, quote, if you keep your body free from disease and sensual pleasure, it will help you to serve what is more noble. St. Gregory of Nyssa, basing himself on a very concrete example, develops his explanation of this process accomplished by temperance, a process of refocusing and of turning back to God the desirative power's energy, dispersed by sin and leached by the passions. Moreover, he shows that it is sufficient for temperance to contain and channel this energy, that is to say, to prevent it from being dispersed, in order for it to serve the good and raise man up to God, Indeed, as we have seen, all the human faculties, and particularly the desires of power, are by nature constantly in movement, yet cannot be shared among the spiritual and carnal realities that mutually exclude one another. It also suffices to turn the desire of power away from the latter realities so that it may be turned toward the former. St. Gregory writes, quote, from On Virginity, Just as water sealed within a hermetic conduit, is often pushed upwards vertically by the rising pressure for lack of space for expansion, and this despite its natural movement that pushes it down, so too the human intellect, strictly channeled from all directions by temperance, will be as though lifted up to the desire for superior goods by its natural tendency to move, lacking any exit or place of diversion. For the being in constant movement having received such a nature from its creator, can never be stabilized. And if it is prevented from employing its movement in the direction of vain things, it has no other recourse but to go straight to reality. End of quote. Temperance, notes Evagrius, heals the soul's desire of part. First, it heals the souls of the so-called bodily passions, i.e. primarily gluttony and lust but its therapeutic effects also extend to all the soul's passions. St. Basil thus writes in a general way, temperance is the destruction of sin, the annihilation of the passions. However, in a more particular, more particularly, temperance appears to be one of the basic remedies of the passion of love of self. The source of all passions, as well as the passion immediately linked to it, and all the passions deriving thence, the love of pleasure. St. Dorotheus of Gaza notes, quote, The physician of our souls is Christ, who gives to each passion the appropriate remedy, temperance against the love of pleasure. Temperance not only heals the desirative part of the soul, but also contributes to the healing of all the soul's faculties. By turning desire and the other powers away from sensual pleasure, temperance restores them, leading them from their wicked contra-natural orientation to an orientation in conformity with their nature, their final end goal. St. Maximus notes, quote, Through temperance, man makes straight the twisted paths of voluntary passions, that is, the movement, movements of pleasure. Questions to Thalassius. Besides its therapeutic function, temperance also has a preventative one. It keeps man from every sin since by mortifying lust in him, it renders him insensitive to what solicits the passion. But temperance also removes from man every attraction to sin by breaking in him the thorn of sensual delight. As St. Maximus says, quote, self-control keeps the intellect dispassionate in the face both of things and the conceptual images we derive from them. It deprives the demons of any power to trouble the soul, whether while conscious or asleep. Henceforth, it preserves the soul's desirative power in peace. If passionate desires is the sickness of the soul, temperance is the soul's health, writes St. Basil. Through temperance, the soul's desirative part regains the order of its nature, its final end goal, and a use in conformity with reason. St. Maximus remarks, a soul's motivation is rightly ordered when its desiring power is subordinated to self-control. 
For this reason, it is a virtue and a source of virtues. The virtue most immediately connected to temperance and which is the sign of its fulfillment is that which is called in Greek literally the soundness of mind, prudence, discretion, as well as sanity and moderation and sensual desires, self-control, temperance, and further, the state of a soul pure of any attachment to sensual pleasures, whatever they may be, and which in this context can be translated as chastity, or better yet, as spiritual integrity. On the subject of temperance's relationship to chastity, St. Basil writes, Temperance does not teach chastity, it procures it. In the same vein, St. Dorotheus of Gaza notes that he who masters himself with knowledge by temperance hopes to obtain chastity. Since it prevents the soul's desirative power from dividing up and being dispersed among multiple passions, gathering it together on the contrary, and making it one single desire directed toward God, temperance reunifies not only the desirative power, but also all the other powers that delighted themselves in it or on account of it. The virtue thus contributes in large part to abolishing the various divisions which fallen man knows, leading his soul back to its original unity and simplicity. Since it heals man of sin and the passions, particularly those relegating him to sensual pleasure, temperance gives man freedom. St. Basil notes, temperance frees us because it is once medicine and power. Through it, man regains his spiritual autonomy, and this likens him to God. God, writes St. Basil, is temperance, since he desires nothing and has all in himself. As he lacks nothing, he is in absolute plentitude. Temperance contributes to man's introduction to spiritual knowledge because it purifies the desirative power of the passions that had darkened the noose. Clement of Alexandria thus considers this virtue as the foundation of knowledge of God, and St. Maximus places it alongside charity, which, according to all the fathers, is the gate of knowledge. Quote, Do not neglect love and self-control, for it is these which, once they have purified the soul's passable aspect, always keep open for you the way to such knowledge. It is for this reason that the Savior says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, 8. They shall see him and the riches that are in him when they have purified themselves through love and self-control. And the greater their purity, the more they will see. By purifying man, temperance makes him worthy to approach God and be, unite himself to him. It contributes to making man in the end a partaker of the divine life and rendering him incorruptible in the likeness of the incorruptible God. 3. Courage We have seen that through sin, the irascible power has become ill. Man has used it to accomplish the will of the devil and the demons, to fight for the fulfillment of the desires of the flesh, and the acquisition and preservation of sensual pleasure, to facilitate the exercise of the passions, and to satisfy self-love. But we have also seen that this faculty, healing, cannot be accomplished by its inhibition or elimination. This faculty is not only useful, rendering man the greatest service, as the fathers recall, but it is also an indispensable instrument for him in the attainment of divine goods, according to Christ's own teaching. Quote, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the men of violence take it by force. Matthew eleven twelve. For the kingdom of God is preached, and every one enters it violently. Luke sixteen sixteen. It is thus fitting, not to mortify this faculty, but to convert it, in order to put it to work in accordance with nature, as created by God. See Hezekiah the priest on watchfulness and holiness one twenty six. To continue, first of all, man restores to his soul's irascible power a use befitting its nature, corresponding to its normal end goal in constituting its health, by fighting against evil in all its forms. For God has given it to man as a weapon to this very end. In the first place, this is a matter of utilizing the irascible power to fight against sin, 
and the passions, including the passion of anger, which is formed by the perverted use of this power. Commenting on this recommendation of the psalmist, quote, be angry but sin not. Psalm 4.4, St. John Cassian writes, Does it not clearly mean to be angry with your vices and your wrath? He notes again, We can recognize that the instinct for anger is beneficial to us, so that we may be enraged at our own vices and mistakes, and be all the more zealous for virtue and spiritual learning. More generally speaking, irascibility must have as its function the battle against the old man, and his evil tendencies, and the fight against the man of the desires of the flesh. St. Hezekias the priest writes, We should use our insensive power against our outer self. Be incensed, it is written, against sin, that is, be incensed with yourselves. The fight against the passions and against the evil tendencies of the old man basically takes the form of an interior struggle against the thoughts inspired by the demons, a battle against the temptations. Commenting on the fourth verse of Psalm 4, St. John Cassianos writes, quote, We are therefore commanded to be angry in a right sense against our own selves and the evil thoughts that occur to us, and not to sin, that is, not to let them come to effect. He further remarks, again from his Institutes, quote, True, we have the healthy instinct of anger given us for a valid reason, for which alone it is useful and healthy to feel angry. That is, when we are aroused to combat the evil passions of our own hearts. This this fight cannot be separated from the fight against the devil and the demons themselves, who suggest evil to man, inciting him to accomplish it and desiring to subject him to their will. For this reason, St. Hezekias the priest writes, quote, Fittingly and in accordance with nature, we should use our insensive power against Satan, on watchfulness and holiness. Evagrius likewise says, Anger is given to us so that we might fight against the demons. St. Gregory of Nyssa writes in like manner, As for irascibility, anger, and hatred, it is necessary that they use their natural might against the thief, against the enemy who sneaks inside to steal the divine treasure and comes in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Scriptural Citation, John 10.10 On this topic, St. Basil recalls the words spoken by God to men as related in the book of Genesis. Quote, I will put enmity between you and the serpent. Genesis 3.15 Here one could cite the numerous passages in the Psalms by which the faithful man is urged to follow the psalmist's example and display such a hatred with regard to the demons that are variously designated and typified in them. That is, the impious, the sinners, the wicked, the enemies, the adverse powers, the foreign nations, the princes, etc. Man is also urged in these hymns to ask God to use his own anger against them so as to distance them, reduce them to impotence, or destroy them. But if man thus fights against the will of the demons, he does this so that God's will might be accomplished in him. If he fights against the passions, it is so that the virtues might have a place in him. If he fights against the old man's tendency, it is so that he might be able to become a new man in Christ. Thus, the irascible powers battle against the various forms of evil, appear as a battle with what is good in mind. Evagrius writes, quote, The rational soul operates according to nature when the irascible part fights to obtain virtue. End of quote, Practicos 86. To continue, the fight for virtue is first of all a fight for its acquisition. Here, the irascible power appears to be a driving force of the spiritual life, a power directing the soul entirely toward God. Thus, St. Basil writes, If you make good use of anger, and if you use it according to the rules of reason, it will be changed into might. Homily 10 on anger. But it is also a fight to preserve this virtue. While anger, in its pathological use, fights to preserve sensual goods, 
and its healthy use it fights so that the spiritual goods received from God might not be plundered by the enemy. In this sense, St. Maximus advises the following, quote, May the aggressive power fight so as to keep God. In fighting for divine goods, the irascible power also fights for spiritual pleasure and the beatitude that is consequent upon it. Instead of fighting as it did in a pathological sense, with sensual pleasures in mind, its aim being to strive against every pleasure. It must be stressed that anger, corresponding to the virtuous use of the irascible part, aiding in what St. Paul calls the good fight, 1 Timothy 6.12, and which the Father's name, controlled use of the insensitive power, and just anger, is, or righteous indignation, is distinct from passionate anger not only in aim, but also in form. For these two reasons, virtuous anger or righteous indignation is an anger free from sin, which fact the psalmist evokes when he says, be angry, but sin not. Or again, speaking of spiritual enemies, I hate them with perfect hatred. Psalm one hundred thirty eight twenty two. This, in fact, is a mastered anger, untroubled, which is thus completely compatible with dispassion the goal of praxis. In this virtuous use, irascibility can be likened to the virtue of courage. Thus, Evagrius writes, quote, the virtue of the irascible part is termed courage. Likewise, St. Maximus writes, quote, according to nature, anger is courage. End of quote. Whereas man rendered his irascible power ill and thereby his entire soul, by using this power passionately, he returns it to health by using it virtuously, making use of it as a remedy, and thus rendering its function normal. As St. John Chrysostom notes, quote, If anger has been placed in us, it is not that we might sin, it is not that it might become a passion in us, an infirmity, but rather that it might be a cure for the passions. The irascible power used well thus appears on the path of spiritual healing, to be the main helper of the rational faculty that has become prudent. For reason, when spiritually enlightened, can indicate the way of good and the battles necessary to fight in order to advance along this path, but it cannot of itself force man to follow this way, nor hand over the battle. The irascible power is the strength the reason needs in order to do this. Without it, the reason would remain powerless. On this theme, St. Basil writes, Quote, just as a soldier who is obedient to the orders of his captain is always ready to run to the aid of those in need, so too anger can help reason in fighting sin. Indignation serves as motivation for the soul. It inspires it with strength, with courage, with steadfastness, so as to lead the effort to its conclusion. It gives vigor and resolve to a mind that allows itself to be softened by pleasure. We shall never have the loathing for sin that we ought if we are not moved by indignation and anger, with the result that when anger has been subjected to reason, one must love it just as much as one must hate it when it is irrational. End of quote. Like St. Basil, many of the fathers underscored the essential role that the irascible power, thus restored to its normal operation, plays in energizing the entire spiritual life. St. John Chrysostom notes, quote, Anger is a useful instrument for rousing our soul from its excessive sloth and in giving vigor to the soul. St. Maximus advises, Let the whole spirit order itself with God in mind, stretch taut like some cord by the mode of aggressiveness. Truly, there is no spiritual life without combat. Without enlisting all his strength, man cannot receive the strength that God gives him. Without courage, he cannot resist the relentless attacks of the enemies of his salvation or confront the many snares that lay for him. If, as we shall see, prudence is what illumines his path, it is in large part irascibility that allows him to advance upon it. 4. Prudence We have seen how sin has sickened the human faculties of knowledge. 
and turning away from God so as to turn toward sensible realities, man has become ignorant of God and the true nature of created beings. Only after being delivered from all the passions at the end of praxis is man able to be healed of this twofold ignorance. First, the ignorance of the spiritual reasons of creatures, after which he regains wisdom, and second, the ignorance of God, which is healed by the knowledge he receives from the Spirit when he is deemed worthy. In such a way he recovers the perfect health of his faculties of knowledge. Yet even on the level of praxis, and from the very beginning of his application of it, man must regain the good use of his faculties of knowledge, which is necessitated by praxis. This good usage is manifested in the first place by the virtue of prudence. We have seen that in the aftermath of sin, man acquired a confused knowledge of good and evil, taking as his standards pleasure and pain instead of the will of God. He thus strayed away from prudence and wisdom and became insane, falling into a state of madness. If he wishes to advance along the path of spiritual conversion, which consists in turning away from evil and doing good, he must again be able to distinguish the two clearly and without being deceived. Prudence's first function then is to distinguish between good, evil, and that which is neither. On a more advanced level, it is the capacity to distinguish with clarity among the manifestations of the inner life what comes from God or his angels or what proceeds from the devil or the demons. Thus, it corresponds very precisely to the discernment of spirits of which the Apostle Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 12.10. Generally speaking, prudence's role is in all situations to discern God's will. In all the modes of this first function, prudence is similar to the virtue of discernment, and the Holy Father is often designated as such. As St. John Cashin recalls, this virtue is called, quote, the eye and the lamp of the body. In the Holy Gospel, when Christ teaches, quote, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is not sound, your whole body will be full of darkness. Matthew six twenty two and following. Prudence, therefore, quote, sees and casts light on all a person's thoughts and actions and discerns everything that must be done. St. John Climacus writes in the same vein, Discernment is a light in darkness, the illumination of those whose sight is dim. And, generally speaking, discernment is and is recognized as the certain understanding of the divine will on all occasions, in every place, and in all matters. Step 26, the latter. Furthermore, the psalmist evokes this virtue when he asks God, quote, Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Psalm 142.10 And again, teach me the way I should go, for to thee I lift up my soul. Prudence is thus the guide, allowing whoever is advancing along the spiritual path to refrain from going astray and to avoid falls. Recalling this passage from Proverbs, quote, When there is no guidance, a people falls. St. John Cashin notes, It is that, i.e. prudence, is also said to be the guidance of our life. Consequently, prudence is the guardian of the virtues, at the same time as being a haven, sheltering man from the assaults of evil. St. Basil writes, quote, Whoever follows prudence never wanders from the works of virtue, and is never pierced by the deadly dart of vice. More generally, prudence and discretion allows man to know his inner state and find his bearings as regard his spiritual progress, allowing him, in particular, to see the course that has been run and to determine what remains for him to do. See Ladder, Step 26. The second function of prudence, as Evagrius notes, is, quote, to war against the hostile powers, and to protect the virtues, to draw up its forces against the vices, and to arrange affairs according to the requirements of the times, and further to fight against the fury of the demons. Prudence here is the greatest strategist of the battle man must inevitably fight in praxis against the devil and the demons. Evagrius further states that 
the battle cannot be well fought except with prudence. It is worth noting that Christ himself recommends one to be prudent by calling to mind the difficulties along the spiritual path that are the results of the demons, especially. Quote from Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. This second function of prudence is closely linked to the first, for it is not simply a matter of clearly distinguishing what comes from God or the angels from what comes from the demons, or of noting the latter's assaults. Rather, at heart is also the discernment of the modes of these attacks, which can be both complex and quite varied, and the foiling of the demon's ruses, something possible only with the sure knowledge of God's will indicating the true good to man. Furthermore, prudence has the function of affirming among the other powers of the soul the hegemonic character of the rational part, the virtue of which prudence constitutes on the level of praxis. Its task, consequently, is to encourage the other powers to submit themselves to the rational part in the battle that must be fought against the demons and the passions. In this activity, its primary activity is to guard the irascible power. Finally, prudence in a more general way has the function of governing the soul's different powers and of reordering them by having them work according to their true nature. Thus, St. Hezekias advises, quote, our intelligence should control our insensitive power and our desire with wisdom and skill, regulating them, admonishing them, correcting them, and ruling them as a king rules over his subjects on Watchfulness and Holiness 126. Gregory of Nisson, Virginity. To continue, this last function is directly linked to the preceding one. On the one hand, it is, quote, by constraining all the powers of the soul to operate according to their nature, that prudence fights against the fury of the demons. Since their primary goal and the essential result of their activity is to lead, man, lead man's different faculties into turning away from God and thus operating contranaturally. On the other hand, the reorientation of the soul's different powers is possible only on the basis of the distinction between good and evil, since this reorientation is what reverts the soul's powers from contranatural activity to an operation in accordance with nature, rendering them virtuous despite their former wickedness. Thus Evagrius writes, quote, those powers which are good or evil according to as they were as they are used well or ill are the objects making up virtue or vice prudence is the virtue that employs these objects for the one or for the other we now understand how saint john cassian could consider prudence and discernment as quote the mother and guardian of all the virtues but also as the source in some way and the root of all the virtues and how Saints John Damascene and Isaac the Syrian and even beheld it as the greatest of all the virtues. As we have said, it is one of the virtues that serves as a prerequisite for acquiring all others. Without prudence, as a guide, men would risk never attaining his goal, given the considerable number of difficulties he must overcome, risks God allows him to avoid through this virtue. Likewise, we understand how prudence and discernment may be considered as an essential means of healing man. Thus, St. John Climacus writes, quote, A discerning man finds health and destroys sickness. Latter step 26. On the one hand, this virtue constitutes a use in accordance with God and thus a healthy use conforming to nature of the soul's rational part. On the other hand, prudence heals the rational part of the madness constituting its perverted usage. St. Maximus recalls, when we misuse the soul's powers, their evil aspects dominate us. For instance, misuse of our power of intelligence results in ignorance and stupidity. The proper use of these powers produces spiritual knowledge and moral judgment. Likewise, St. Basil, having observed that the soul's powers become the instruments of vice or virtue depending on the disposition of him who acts, writes regarding the rational power, 
When it is used well, one becomes wise and prudent. Madness and prudence thus correspond to one another and are mutually opposed, the one taking the other's place as man either turns his reason away from God or turns it back toward him. As a result, the absence of the one implies the presence of the other. Thus, St. Maximus notes, quote, whoever is not angry is prudent. Prudence contributes to the restoring to health not only the intellectual faculties, but also the other faculties. By virtue of its role as a guide and by pointing out the way of good, it helps the faculties reorientate themselves toward God to once again operate in a way that conforms to their natural end goal and thus to regain health. From this standpoint, we can say with St. John Climacus that prudence constitutes the return of wanderers to the way. Chapter 3 the therapeutic role of the spiritual father. Spiritual discernment, as the fathers most often understand it, is a charismata the man receives when he has attained the highest degree of the ascetical life, reached the pinnacle of praxis, and reached dispassion. To the extent that the passions abide in him to any degree, his judgment is distorted and his ability to discern altered. Yet from the very beginning of his spiritual life, man must be able to find his path with certainty. He must be able to avoid the dangers and snares that threaten him on every side and must know at every moment what he must do to accomplish God's will and not wander upon adverse paths. From the start, he must, and to a certain extent is able to, put into action the virtue of prudence, which he acquires especially through prayer and the attentive reading of the Holy Scriptures. But in its initial stages, this virtue does not suffice to provide man all the light he needs in order to advance along the path of praxis, filled as it is with pitfalls. He needs an experienced guide who can make up for what he is still lacking in discernment. This guide is what Holy Tradition calls the spiritual father, or elder, or yeronda, or starets. His role is not limited to instruction or direction. With one voice, the ascetical tradition considers him to be a therapist, able to heal the person who places himself in his care and lead him to health. When starting out on the spiritual path, man still feels a certain reticence, resisting somewhat in giving himself over to a spiritual father and allowing himself to be guided and cared for by him. This is especially the case because, as we shall see in the following, this act demands that he reveal to him his inner life and show him his illnesses. St. Gregory Nazazine notes that in us, quote, the intellect and selfishness, as well as our incapacity and refusal to allow ourselves to be conquered easily, constitute the greatest obstacle to virtue. A kind of mobilization is set into action against those who come to help us. All the energy that we ought to use in revealing our illness to those who can care for it, we use instead to escape from treatment. We use our courage to harm ourselves and our knowledge to battle against our health. End of quote. From orations. We either hide our sin or justify it to ourselves. Quote, and we persist in not allowing ourselves to be cared for by the remedies of wisdom which heal the soul's infirmity, or else we display open impudence with regard to sin and those who are charged with treating it. However, in believing that he can do without a spiritual father, man is mistaken. The spiritual father's assistance is indispensable to whoever should wish to attain health and the end of the spiritual path. St. John Climacus writes, quote, Those who have surrendered themselves to God deceive themselves if they suppose they have no need of a director. Latter step one. Likewise, Saints Callistos and Ignatius Xanthopoulia observe, quote, Those who wish to march without receiving counsel sow with toil and sweat and most often do nothing but dream. St. Nikiforos the Solitary also advises, quote, If you have no guide, you must diligently search for one. The necessity of spiritual direction derives above all from man's difficulty in knowing himself. 
and of adequately judging himself, inasmuch as he has not attained the purity of impassibility, which, as we shall later see, is the key to the fullness of discernment and self-knowledge. Insofar as he is indwelt by the passions, man possesses faulty judgment. As St. Basil observes, man is quick to see the sins of others, but slow to recognize his own imperfections, particularly under the sway of vainglory and pride. We have seen that in large part spiritual progress depends on this recognition. When the fathers bring to mind the necessity of knowing oneself, they most often use by this term knowledge of one's sin. But, generally speaking, all the passions darken and pervert man's judgment. They alter his ability to discern between good and evil and prevent him from seeing what is truly fitting, of having quote, the certain understanding of the divine will on all occasions, in every place, and in all matters. Abbe Zinon says this is why man must not place his trust in himself and cannot come to his own aid. St. Dorotheus of Gaza likewise advises, Never place your trust in your heart, for the ancient passions have rendered it blind. Being passionate, we must in no way trust our own heart, for a twisted rule renders twisted even that which is straight. Following his own judgment, man not only cannot see himself as he is, but also cannot know with certainty which way to follow and constantly risks departing from the right path. Thus, St. Nikiforos the Solitary counsels, quote, from unwatchfulness in the guarding of the heart. This is why we should search for an unerring guide, so that under his instruction we may learn how to deal with the shortcomings and exaggerations suggested to us by the devil whenever we deviate left or right from the axis of attentiveness of Nipsis. Since such a guide will himself have been tested through which what he has suffered, he will be able to make these things clear to us, and will unambiguously disclose the spiritual path so that we can follow it easily. End of quote. Having recourse to a spiritual father is all the more justified by the danger posed to man of following his own will, which in its fallen state tends to oppose God's will. St. Dorotheus of Gaza teaches, quote, If a man does not confide to someone everything within himself, the devil will discover in him a personal will, which will allow him to overcome him. Every time we obstinately attach ourselves to our own will, even while thinking to make wondrous use of it, we lay snares for ourselves and do not know that we run to our own perdition. Indeed, how could we know God's will or truly seek seek it if we place our trust in ourselves and hold fast to our own will? End of quote. Entrusting oneself to a spiritual father thus allows one to conquer this self-will, which, according to Abba Pimon, quote, is a wall of bronze between man and God. This submission also allows for the acquisition of humility, which is necessary. St. John of Gaza writes on this point, quote, If someone has the thought of doing something good for himself and not from questioning the fathers, he is outside the law and does not does nothing legitimate. But whoever, on the contrary, does it with inquiry, fulfills the law and the prophets. For inquiry is a sign of humility, and he who does so imitates Christ, who humbled himself to the point of being a servant. Indeed, it is said that a man without counsel is his own enemy. From the sayings of the Desert Fathers. <clears throat> to continue... Having recourse to a spiritual father is likewise a must for the man wishing to advance in the spiritual life. On account of, of his ignorance of the snares and dangers he will face on that path and of the means of confronting them, thus St. John of Gaza advises, Question the spiritual fathers. Do what they shall tell you. Do not follow your own judgment, but fear lest through ignorance you be in peril. St. Mark the ascetic explains, he who wishes to take up the cross and follow Christ must first acquire spiritual knowledge and understanding through constantly examining his thoughts. He should question other servants of God who are of the same mind and engaged in the same ascetic struggle, so that he does not travel in the dark without a light, not knowing how or where to walk. For the man who goes his own way, traveling without understanding of the Gospels 
and without any guidance, often stumbles and falls into many pits and snares of the devil, he frequently goes astray and exposes himself to many dangers, not knowing where he is going. End of quote. Furthermore, he states, quote, The warfare becomes easier, and they can see their own progress more clearly, especially if they confine their attention strictly to themselves. They should make every effort to seek the company of experienced spiritual fathers and to be guided by them, for it is dangerous to isolate oneself completely, relying on one's own judgment with no one else as a witness, and it is equally dangerous to live with those who are inexperienced in spiritual warfare, for then we become involved in battles of other kinds because the enemy has many hidden ways of attacking us and sets his snares around us on every side. Thus a man should try to live with those who possess spiritual knowledge, or at least to consult them constant, continually, so that even if he is still spiritually immature and childish and does not himself possess a lamp of true knowledge, he can travel in company with someone who does. Then he will not be walking in the dark, in danger from snares and traps, and he will not fall prey to the demons who prowl like beasts in the dark, seizing and destroying those who who grope there without the spiritual lamp of God's word. <clears throat> End of quote. Given the multitude of these dangers, falls are inevitable without guidance and greatly risk being irreparable. The author of Ecclesiastes stresses this fact. Quote, Woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Ecclesiastes 4.10 St. Dorotheus of Gaza teaches in the same vein, quote, from instructions, in Proverbs it is said, Those who have no guide fall like leaves, but salvation is found in much counsel. Proverbs 11.14 <clears throat> Brethren, search the meaning of these words and see what Holy Scripture teaches us. It sets us on guard against trusting in ourselves and against the delusion of believing ourselves to be sensible and capable of guiding ourselves. We need help. We need guides after God. There is nothing more wretched and vulnerable than those who have no guide and fall like leaves. End of quote. As St. Gregory of Nyssa remarks, many have become deluded and fallen for lack of appropriate direction. Contrary to what one might believe, it is not beginners alone who have need of such direction, but also the most sensible adepts who are making progress. Thus St. Maximus writes, the wise man does not regard his own thoughts. It is precisely when he feels convinced that they are true and good that he most distrusts his own judgment. He makes other wise men the judges of his thoughts and arguments, lest he should run, or may have run, in vain. Indeed, the risks of going astray and falling are all the greater the more one progresses. The snares laid by the demons are all the more numerous and subtle the more man advances and approaches his goal. The roads he takes are less and less known to him, since they are more and more foreign compared to the worldly roads to which he had thus far been accustomed. Without the help of an experienced spiritual father who knows the path on account of having traveled it himself, and who knows what sort of snares there are, man cannot achieve his goal. St. John Climacus thus notes that many who were, quote, about to set out on a long journey, midway either fell into dangers or turned back, being unprepared for tribulations, for lack of worthy discretion, direction. Only through submission to an elder will a man be able to follow the path of the Holy Fathers without error or danger, to the end. This is the only path allowing one to attain perfection, as St. John Cashin explains several times. Now, if we desire to reach the totality of true virtue and very fact, we should follow those masters and guides who have not just dreamed about it in empty phrases, but are capable of teaching us and bringing to us what they have truly learned by experience, showing us the sure path by which we might achieve that very goal. The Lord shows the way of perfection to no one who has the means of being educated, but who disdains the teaching and the instructions of the elders, and who considers as insignificant that saying which ought to be diligently observed, quote, ask your father and he will declare it to you, your elders, and they will tell you. 
Deuteronomy 32, 7. The elder is a spiritual father. This means that the relationship between the elder and the person whom he guides does not take the form of a master and his disciple, but rather that of a father and his son. The archetype for this relationship lies in that between the heavenly father and the men who are his sons by adoption, sons of the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Ephesians 3.14 and this means that the relationship uniting the spiritual father and his spiritual son is one of mutual love. Likewise, this means that the function of the spiritual father is not limited to teaching, as in the case of a master. As the name indicates, the spiritual father's main task is to give birth to his son spiritually, to cause him to be born from on high, and to help him grow into the stature of the mature man in Christ, as the Apostle points out to his own spiritual children, quote, My little children, with whom I am again in travail until Christ be formed in you, Galatians 4.19. His function is thus not speculative, but operative. This operative role is equally made manifest in the concrete care he gives his son, who comes to him sick and seeking healing. Indeed, if the spiritual father is a guide, it is not because he utters abstract comments. He does not map out the right path on paper. Rather, he treads the path along with his son, bearing him upon his shoulders. He helps him in a real way to keep to the right path, to discern and overcome the obstacles on it, and to traverse to the end of the different stages. The main obstacles to spiritual progress are formed by the passions, which are as such spiritual illnesses as we've shown. For this reason, the role of the spiritual father takes on a fundamentally therapeutic character in his helping the person affected by these passions be, to be delivered from them. Thus, exercising spiritual fatherhood is quite often likened by the fathers to a branch of medicine dealing with the soul that is analogous to medicine interacting with the body. This parallel is developed at length by St. Gregory Nazazine in his orations too. To continue... In ascetical texts, the spiritual father is frequently referred to as spiritual physician, or just simply physician. Footnote. From the Tipicon of the Monastery of the Forerunner, we find this characteristic formulation, quote, I desire that there be spiritual fathers in the monastery, so that each monk might disclose his wounds according to the tradition of the holy canons to the one whom he should choose, so as to receive the proper aid as conforms to each type of injury from the hand of the spiritual physician, for it is very useful to have a physician close at hand. End of quote. In other cases, the context frequently makes this characterization explicit. To continue, St. Athanasius of Alexandria says that St. Anthony was truly given as a physician to Egypt. Speaking more broadly of the Desert Fathers, St. Amamanas says God has sent them, possessing all the virtues in the midst of men so that they might heal their illnesses. Specifying, for they were physicians of souls and were able to heal their illnesses. Abba Anthony likewise says, the fathers of old left for the desert and were healed. They became physicians, and examining others, they healed them. St. John Chrysostom notes that the experienced monk will manage to heal completely whoever comes to him. St. John Climacus states that the patients will get the right cure from God's care and from their spiritual physicians. Step 8. And he calls to mind those who are are healed of the passions of the soul by the care of the physicians. He advises, quote, lay bare your wound to the physician, since he notes that few are healed without a physician. To one of his correspondents, St. John of Gaza counsels, entreat the saints as one who is not doing well and needs a physician, and take advantage of their help until God should lead you to perfect health. St. Gregory Nazazine speaks of the priests who exercise the duties of spiritual fatherhood as, quote, those to whom the practice of medicine has been entrusted, saying further, we priests are the servants and co-workers 
in this science of spiritual medicine. Some spiritual fathers present themselves either explicitly or implicitly as physicians. Footnote, as an example from John Moskos' Spiritual Meadow 78, where we see the Iguman John speaking to one of his visitors, quote, just as there are many kinds of sins, so also there are many remedies. If you want to be healed, tell me in all truth what you have done, so that I might bring in the appropriate cure. End of quote. We find several other ancient examples of this, even predating Christianity. The members of the community of ascetics, whose life Philo of Alexandria narrates, called themselves therapists. Philo writes from On the Contemplative Life, quote, The deliberative intention of the philosopher is at once displayed from the appellation given to them. For with strict regard to etymology, they are called physicians and therapists, because they practice a kind of medicine more excellent than that in general use in cities. For that heals only bodies, but the other heals souls which are under the mastery of terrible and almost incurable diseases, which the innumerable multitude of passions and vices have inflicted upon them. End of quote. They are given these names not only because they seek by the life they live to be healed of their own spiritual illnesses, but also, as St. Eusebius of Caesarea notes, because they tend to and heal the souls of those who come to them. To care for and guide other men spiritually is no easy task. Not only the complexity of the human soul, its very nature, and the lofty goal it has in sight, but also the frequently hidden and imperceptible external character of the spiritual realities involved, as well as the specific nature of the battle to be waged against the fearsome and visible enemies, are sufficient grounds to explain why spiritual medicine is a more difficult art than bodily medicine, as St. Gregory Nazazine stresses. He writes from his orations, quote, In truth, it seems to me that guiding man, who is the most diverse and most complex of beings, is the art of arts and the science of sciences. This is an easy thing to grasp if a parallel is established between the medicine of souls and the therapy of bodies. The more one realizes how laborious the latter is, the more the comparison reveals that the medicine we practice requires even more toil, and the more this medicine appears precious on account of the nature of the object which concerns it. The resources of the science involved as well as the intended goal of the expended energy in the first case we are concerned with the body that is perishable matter emitting discharges and at any rate destined to disintegrate and suffer its condition with the other medicine we are concerned for this soul that comes from god is divine participates in the celestial grandeur and hastens to recover it Let us, end of quote, let us add this other motif. The former medicine has little use for analyzing the depths. The greater part of its work is concerned with appearances, whereas we put all our zeal and care into studying the hidden man of the heart, and we fight against an enemy who wages an interior battle and war against us. Quote, such are the reasons which cause us to consider that the medicine we practice is by far more laborious than that which is practiced on the body, and that this medicine of ours even confers a greater value to the body. The difficulty of this task means that those who are able to perform it are quite rare, even if many believe themselves capable of it. The risk of delusion on this point is great as long as one has not attained passionlessness. Thus it is necessarily follows that there are many deceivers and false masters in this domain. In order to be a true spiritual guide and therapist, it is absolutely necessary to have healthy doctrines. In other words, to be perfectly orthodox and to be faithful to the teachings of the ancient fathers in therapeutic practice. St. Gregory of Nyssa writes on this topic, quote, Just as men found through experience the medicine that was unknown in former times, and saw that it was gradually revealed to be both useful and harmful thanks to certain observations recognized by the witness of experience. 
thus entering into the teaching of this art. And just as the observations of this vanguard serve as precepts for the future, so too he who now works at this art is not obliged to test by his own experience the efficacy of these medicines as to whether it is something pernicious or something helpful. Rather, after gaining his knowledge from others, he himself has practiced his art with success. So it is with the art of healing souls. I wish to say, the philosophy by which we learn the therapy for every passion that afflicts the soul. One must in no way pursue this science by conjecture or su supposition, but with a great capacity to learn alongside one who has acquired this disposition through long and rich experience. End of quote from On Virginity. Nonetheless, this is not sufficient. In addition, it is important that the spiritual father not only lead a life conforming to his teachings, but also have that he have experience. For this reason, St. Simon the New Theologian issues this admonition, Do not put yourselves in the hands of an inexperienced master, for he will sooner initiate you into the diabolical life than the evangelical one. And St. John Cashin gives this counsel, if we desire to reach the totality of true virtue in very fact, we should follow those masters and guides who have not just dreamed about it in empty phrases, but are capable of teaching us and bringing us to what they have truly learned by experience. If it is a matter here of the spiritual father having learned from the elders, it is a practical form which this apprenticeship needs to have taken on. He must have acquired their very own experience by leading a life similar to theirs under their supervision. Under their direction, the spiritual father himself needs to have traveled the entire path, which is his task, in order to help his spiritual children run the same course. It is necessary that he himself have avoided the snares and overcome the obstacles which stand in their path, and that he have victoriously submitted to all the trials through which they will all have to pass. For in Christ's image, quote, because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Hebrews 2.18. He must have his own house in order before he can purport to put the homes of others in order, as the apostle shows, quote, for if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how can he care for God's church? 1 Timothy 3.5. He himself must have acquired all the virtues and qualities that his spiritual children are supposed to acquire. In other words, the spiritual physician himself needs to have been healed and be in good health for this therapeutic work to be effective. St. Basil writes, quote, If disorder and lack of discipline reign in your house, the proverb, Physician, heal thyself, will be turned back to you by those who you are in charge. Let us, therefore, heal ourselves, first of all. This follows on the teaching of Christ himself, who cautions, quote, If a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into the pit. Matthew fifteen fourteen, And who notes, How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite? First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Matthew 7, 4. In this perspective, St. Nihilus condemns those who rush to others and take upon themselves the care of healing them, whereas they have not yet been healed of their own wicked inclinations and thus can in no way heal anyone to a victory which they themselves have not yet won. On the contrary, St. John Climacus notes regarding those who have been assailed by every illness and have stricken to be healed of them, quote, after their restoration to health, they become physicians. For all, teaching us the habits of every disease and from their own personal experience, able to rescue those who are about to fall. For his part, St. Anthony remarks that after sojourning in the desert and having been healed, quote, the fathers of old became physicians and looking into others, healed them. St. Amamonas, calling to mind these fathers, who were physicians of souls and were able to heal their illnesses, observes that they were only sent to men when their own illnesses had been cured, and that it would have been impossible for God to send them if they had still been ill. In the end, 
we can say with St. John Climacus that, quote, a physician is he who suffers from no carnal or spiritual malady and has no need of any remedy from other men. If one pretends to be a spiritual physician without fulfilling this definition, one cannot but fall into even graver illnesses. Ascetical Homily 58. St. Isaac notes that many claiming to care for others, quote, have prescribed death for themselves, since their soul was still subject to illness. They did not attend to its health. They cast themselves into the sea of this world in order to heal the souls of others, while they themselves were still sick. And they have lost their souls, far from the hope in God, since the illness of their senses was able neither to confront the flame of the things which exasperated the wound of the passions, nor to resist this flame. End of quote from Ascetical Homily 21. For this reason, he advises, quote, If a man senses that he is losing his own health and wanting to heal others, let such a man remember the word of the apostle who exhorts and says, Solid food is for the mature. Hebrews 5.14 Let him turn back, lest he hear Christ tell him as an example, Physician, heal thyself. Let him condemn himself and keep his own strength, for he too is sick, and more than others does he have need of being healed. When he knows that his soul is healthy, let him then also serve others and heal them by his own health. Sedeco Homily 56 The risk of aggravating one's own illnesses, a risk run by whoever wishes to heal others while he himself is not healed, derives particularly from the fact that the work of the spiritual guide and therapist inevitably tends to cause the two great and serious passions, vainglory and pride, to crop up and develop. As we have seen, the latter is a quite frequently a cause of falls for those who are very advanced spiritually. Moreover, whoever is not himself in good health risks being infected, or at least affected, by the illnesses of others. For this reason, St. Isaac the Syrian teaches, the solid food of spiritual fatherhood is for those who are healthy, whose senses are trained, and who are able to eat anything. I mean to say that they can withstand the assaults that the senses sustain, and that their heart is not damaged by all that they encounter in the practice of perfection. St. Simeon the New Theologian observes that only the saints are able to remain detached from the passions under their treatment, and in no wise troubled by them. The thought of the saints, if it comes to investigate the quagmire of human shame and passions, is not sullied thereby, for their intellect is bare and foreign with regard to every desire of the passions. If this thought should decide on occasion to undertake an examination of such states, it does so with the sole aim of observing and understanding the disordered movements of the passions and their effects in order to know whence they derive and conversely what remedies neutralize them as we hear physicians do and as we have heard the elders say they dissect cadavers to understand the body's layout in order thereby to understand the interior composition of the living and to attempt to treat hidden afflictions in others such in some is the method likewise practiced by the spiritual physician who desires to heal by experience the passions of the souls. Whoever wishes to heal others without being himself perfectly healed risks not only aggravating his own illnesses, but also of infecting those for whom he claims to care with even graver illnesses. For not knowing from experience either what health consists of or what the true nature of illnesses is, he is unable to lead others to healing and can only give them advice that leads them astray. Being subject to the passions, such a physician cannot possess the purity that alone allows one to know hearts and deposit a diagnosis with knowledge of the causes, nor is he able to prescribe the treatment applicable to the particular illness at hand. St. Gregory of Nyssa remarks on this topic. Quote, in the treatments we provide, a single and self-same remedy is not always very salutary or very hazardous for the same people. It seems to me that it depends on the circumstances, the events, and what the character of the patients permits. 
It is impossible to encompass all these elements with the greatest exactitude so as to come to a treatise on this medicine, no matter what care and intelligence one might bring to the task. Rather, the events and the experience themselves make manifest the medicine and the physician. End of quote. We see that it is important that the physician be sure and his experience be just. For, quote, in this area, if one veers to the right or the left by fault or ignorance, the danger of falling into sin, for the one concerned and for those whom he leads, it's extraordinary. Thus, for many essential reasons, the first condition for exercising spiritual fatherhood is possessing spiritual health. This brings us back to the point, stemming as it does from the preceding considerations and from what we shall see later, that the spiritual father must be pure of every passion in order to be able correctly to perform his function as a guide and therapist. St. John Climacus, for example, writes, quote, The physician should completely strip himself of the passions, exclaiming, Blessed is freedom from nausea among physicians, and blessed is dispassion among shepherds. Impassibility, dispassion, is what allows the spiritual father to be enlightened by God in his work and to receive the light of the spirit, without which he cannot be an effective therapist and authentic guide, but is rather a blind man leading another blind man. Whoever does not have the light of the Holy Spirit in himself is like someone walking around in darkness with an extinguished lamp, explains St. Simeon the New Theologian. Quote, he cannot see his actions as he ought, nor can he obtain the assurance that these are in conformity with God's good pleasure. As to guiding others or teaching them God's will, he is all the more unable to do so, not to speak of his being unworthy of receiving the thoughts of others, until he should possess the light shining within him. Quote, he who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. John 12, 35. And this man thus does not know where he goes, how will he show the way to others? The illumination of the Holy Spirit confers on the spiritual father a power that is especially necessary for this work, that of cardiognosis. This spiritual charisma allows him to read the heart and know directly and intimately the inner man. Consequently, he passes over the level of appearances, which are frequently deceptive to perceive in his spiritual son what the latter himself is ignorant of, his unconscious illnesses, his tendencies, his secret thoughts. He who is perfectly purified sees the soul of his neighbor, although not the actual substance of the soul, and can tell its state, notes St. John Climacus. In the latter, step 26. And St. Simon the New Theologian writes, Quote, he who sees and hears spiritually when perceiving someone meets and supports him frequently. He sees his soul not as regards its essence, but as regards its state and what its qualities and aptitudes are. If then he has been judged worthy to partake of the Holy Spirit, he finds this knowledge in the very vision of the other. End of quote. This charismatic knowledge in no way helps the spiritual father to judge and condemn his spiritual child. His passionlessness shields him from this. Rather, it merely allows him to offer a more accurate diagnosis of his child's state and thus determine the best course of treatment. As St. Irenaeus says, the spiritual father makes manifest the secrets of men exclusively for their profit. Meanwhile, discernment is not the only quality that the spiritual father must possess. If having attained impassibility, he possesses all the virtues, and we shall see the one corresponds to the other. He is thus marked by the virtues that more specifically pertain to his role. First of all, we must mention humility, which is at once the condition and sign of genuine spiritual fatherhood. This humility especially has the result of feeling the spiritual father has of being a sinner himself, even of being a greater one than the person whom he guides and for whom he cares. Consequently, this state leads him to experience a pain equivalent to the one felt by his charge. Thus, St. John Chrysostom notes, 
quote, in bodily treatment, whoever makes the incision and the wound does not feel the pain of the operation. The poor man who is operated upon is the only one torn apart by sharp pains. It is not the same case in spiritual treatment. He who speaks is the first to feel pain when he corrects others, end of quote. One sees closely linked to the spiritual father's humility the compassion he feels regarding those under his care. This compassion is accompanied by a total self-denial that leads the spiritual father to neglect in all things his own person for the sake of what is useful to others and to lay down his own soul on behalf of the soul of his neighbor, causing him to feel responsible for those who entrust themselves to his care. The same compassion leads him to bear their burden, according to the Holy Apostles' counsel in Galatians 6, 2, and to take on their illnesses, following the example of Christ, who took upon himself men's infirmities. Compassion is one of the manifestations of love that moves the genuine spiritual father, a love that furthermore results in always being available, in being exceedingly patient, and in being very gentle and lenient. St. Dorotheus of Gaza remarks that the saints, quote, do not hate the sinner, they do not judge him, they do not flee from him, rather they have compassion for him, they exhort him, they console him, and they care for him as a, for a sick member. They do everything to save him. Besides, this attitude is the prerequisite for effective therapy, as St. Isaac the Syrian stresses. Quote, if you desire to heal illnesses, know that men touched by illnesses have greater need of being cared for than of being chastised. The beginning of the wisdom of God is leniency and gentleness, which is characteristic of a great soul and bears the illnesses of others. Indeed, it is said, you who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. Romans 15, 1. And again, restore the man who has sinned in a spirit of gentleness. St. Simeon the New Theologian, in calling to mind the same virtues, insists on the qualities of understanding and welcoming that the true spiritual father possesses. A sick man goes to find a spiritual physician. The compassionate human doctor examines this illness. He understands his brother's weakness, the inflammation and swelling of the disease. He sees the sick man entirely under the power of death. When the spiritual physician sees his brother in the state described, he does not immediately cry out, nor does he take off his gown while saying to him, What you ask is wrong and deadly, and I refuse to give this, you this aid. Lest hearing this, the sick man take flight and go to another practitioner, lacking the experience of these afflictions. He would die that very hour. On the contrary, the physician keeps him and comforts him, showing himself at once to be full of love and simplicity. Far from choosing his spiritual children, the spiritual father must receive without discrimination all who come to him and must evince his solicitude most especially towards those who are sicker and have greater need of a physician, following Christ's example. St. John Climacus advises, Quote, Nothing has so manifested our Creator's love and goodness toward us as his leaving his ninety and nine sheep and going in search of one gone astray. Luke 15.4 Give heed, therefore, a wondrous man, and toward him that is broken and gone very, very astray, show all your love, all your zeal, fervency, care, and prayer to God. For wherever there are great illnesses and wounds, there are also great recompenses will undoubtedly be given from the latter to the shepherd. Moreover, the value of the spiritual guide and therapist is recognized by his ability to lead the sickest to health and the least endowed to perfection. As St. John Climacus notes, commenting further that a physician will perceive the knowledge given him by God when he is able to cure passions thought by many to be incurable. Whoever wishes to attain spiritual health and perfection must seek out a therapist and guide possessing all these qualities, even though such men are rare and every generation has but a few. St. John Climacus advises many times over that one should take good care in choosing a spiritual father. Before making a commitment, 
He says one must investigate and examine, lest one mistake a sick man for a doctor, a passionate for a dispassionate man. In any case, for in accordance with the corruption of our wounds, we need a director who is indeed an expert and a physician. And when a physician protests his incompetence, then you have to go to another. The criterion of the physician's value is at any rate the efficacy of the treatment he prescribes, and more specifically the results he obtains from the, his treatment of pride, the cancer of the soul. If you come to an unknown physician in hospital, behave as though you were passing by and secretly test the life and spiritual experience of all those living there. And when you begin to feel benefit from the doctors and nurses and get relief from your sicknesses, and especially with regard to your special disease, namely spiritual pride, then go to them and buy it with the gold of humility and write the contract on the parchment of obedience. Having presented the qualifications that the spiritual father must have, we must now show how his therapeutic work operates. The spiritual physician cares for his children first of all through his word. As the inspired author of Proverbs writes, the tongue of the wise brings healing, Proverbs 12:18, And the sayings of the desert fathers show us that the majority of visitors to the desert spoke to them thus, Father, give us a saving word. In so doing, they did not ask for theoretical advice, but for true relief for their soul. The therapeutic power of the word of the fathers often manifests itself straightway, as we see in the lives of the saints and in a good number of the sayings of the desert fathers, where we see these visitors come to the elders in a state of sadness, despondency, or unrest, and then leave full of peace and joy. Evagrius, reporting a visit made in the company of some other brothers to St. Macarios the Great, recalls the words full of life and healing for their souls which the great abbot had spoken to them. By his words, the spiritual father encourages his son, exhorting him, consoling him, and caring for him as for a sick member. If he teaches him something, this is not abstract and speculative in character, but concrete and effective. St. John Cashin underlines both the therapeutic and the preventative power of such a teaching. From his Institute 11, quote, like skillful doctors who do not only treat existing diseases, but know how to prevent future ones and to take precautions with wise advice in medicine. In the same way, these true doctors of the soul treat the emerging diseases of the heart in advance with their spiritual teaching like a heavenly antidote and do not allow them to grow in the minds of the young ones, instructing them both in the causes of their present temptations and the means to cure them. But the spiritual father does not care only through words. Displaying ceaseless concern for his children, he prays for them so that God's therapeutic grace might act upon them. Father, pray for me, is the formula by which the spiritual son very frequently begins or concludes his interactions with his father. Moreover, St. John of Gaza advises this, quote, It is fitting to solicit the prayers of our fathers, for it is said prayer for one another, and also those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, Luke 5.31. And in order to ask for prayer, say this, quote, Abba, I'm not doing well. I supplicate you, pray for me as you know that I need God's mercy. One of the reasons for this request is that the prayer of a righteous man, the spiritual father, has great power in its effects. His holiness allows him to obtain from God what his child is not yet worthy of obtaining. This does not exempt the spiritual child from praying himself. Rather, he knows that his request will be more efficacious if he asks God to hearken to the prayers of his father. Consequently, he will be able to say, like this brother, by his prayers, God gave me health. The spiritual father also acts through the example he gives. Conforming himself perfectly to God's will, he shows his children by each of his acts and every attitude and way of being how they can conform themselves to this will. As St. John Climacus notes, quote, All look upon him as an archetypal image, 
and they consider whatever he says and does as a standard and law. This exemplary value is evoked by St. Paul himself when he recommends, quote, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. Hebrews 13.7 The fathers likewise often stress this value. It should be noted that the example the spiritual father offers through his words, deeds, and attitudes possesses an operative power able to transform those to whom he is connected. The true spiritual father possesses a charismatic force made manifest by his simple presence, the therapeutic power of which is stressed by St. John Climacus. This charismatic power emanating from the Yeronda, from the spiritual father, is none other than the manifestation of the divine grace that indwells him. As the fathers often indicate, the elder speaks and acts according to God. His words and deeds are inspired by the Holy Spirit, God speaking through his mouth and acting through him. This charismatic force also gives the father an exceptional ability to come to the aid of his sons in times of difficulty on the spiritual path and allows him to cure passions through the thought by many to be incurable. Here it must be noted that often and with humility the spiritual father can, quote, benefit the sick in a manner that is unobserved and hidden from them. Nonetheless, the spiritual father does not impose this power which he possesses as a gift from God. His activity does not take place without his spiritual child freely allowing it to act in him. It does not exclude the latter's cooperation but rather implies it. For this reason, the spiritual father's therapeutic work is carried out by means of the treatment he prescribes his spiritual child, which the child must apply and which will be more effective if he puts more care in its application. The perennial mark of the treatment prescribed by the spiritual father is that it is perfectly adapted to the sick person's character, to his particular situation, his current state, and his disposition. The spiritual father as St. John Climacus notes, should examine the case of each man and prescribe medicines which are suitable. Likewise, St. Gregory of Nyssa says, quote, In treating the body, the sole aim of medicine is healing the sick man. However, there are different kinds of treatments corresponding to the various illnesses. In like manner, for the illnesses of the soul being themselves quite diverse, The manner of caring for them must be adapted in order that the remedy may act in accordance with the disease's cause. And St. John Chrysostom states, For the healing of the soul as well as for the body, it is not enough to fit the remedy to the ill, but one must also apply it at the appropriate time. Thus, as St. Gregory Nazazine counsels, the physician must observe the place, circumstances, age, time, and other things of this sort. Indeed, he explains, quote from his orations, in the treatments we provide, a single and self-same remedy is not always very salutary or very hazardous for the same people. On the contrary, one regimen is good and useful to some, while the opposite regimen has the same effect on others. It seems to me that it depends on the circumstances, the events, and what the character of the patient's permits. It is impossible to encompass all these elements with the greatest exactitude so as to come to a treatise on this medicine, no matter what care and intelligence one might bring to the task. Rather, the events and the experience themselves make manifest the medicine and the physician. End of quote. He notes further, just as one does not give every body the same remedies and nutrition, each one instead receiving the proper treatment according to whether it be in good health or suffer from illness. So too one cares for souls according to differing principles and methods. The witnesses to the treatment's efficacy are the patients themselves. A word prods some. An example governs others. A bit is necessary for the former, a goad for the latter. Some are slow, and with difficulty allow themselves to be pushed toward good. For them, the shock of the word must rouse them. For some, praise is useful, while for others, blame, if used properly. But done in abundance at the wrong time and in the wrong way, both are harmful. 
The one is returned to the right path by an encouraging word, the other by a reprimand. End of quote. St. John Climacus likewise observes, quote, Sometimes what serves as a medicine for one is poison for another, and something, sometimes something given to one and the same person at a suitable time serves as medicine, but at the wrong time it is poison. He gives this example, quote, I have seen an unskilled physician who, by subjecting to dishonor a sick man who was contrite in spirit, only drove him to despair. And I have seen a skilled physician who operated on an arrogant heart with the knife of dishonor and drained it of all its evil-smelling pus. Ladder 26, step 26. Elsewhere, he advises that we must, quote, take into consideration the places wherein they are found, the degree of their spiritual renewal and their habits that of the sick. For there is much variety and difference between them. Often the man who is more infirm will also be more humble, and for this very reason he ought to be more lightly punished by his spiritual judges. The reverse of this is obvious. End of quote. To continue, since he is instructed by his own experience, but also since he is endowed with discernment and is enlightened by the Holy Spirit, the spiritual physician is able to determine the suitable remedy, which for these reasons does not always correspond to what the patient expects. In a certain number of cases where there is much corruption, considerable treatment is needed, which the physician must apply firmly despite the patient's reticence. St. Cyprian in particular notes this, quote, on the, from On the Lapsed. The priest of the Lord must employ curative remedies. A bad physician is one who treats swollen abscesses gently and allows the poison to proliferate in the body's inner recesses. An incision must be made in the wound, and a drastic cure must take place after the gangrenous parts have been removed. Even if the patient protests, cries out, and laments because he cannot withstand the pain, he will later thank the physician as soon as he feels better. End of quote. St. John Climacus does not hesitate to advise the spiritual physician, quote, grieve the sick man for a time, lest from a cursed silence his sickness be prolonged or he die. St. Simon, the new theologian, for his part, considers that in the case where a sick person risks setting himself against a treatment that would be contrary to his expectations, even though suitable in reality, and seeking on the contrary what is not to his advantage, the physician may use cunning. Quote, a sick man goes to find a spiritual physician. Dazed from his suffering, his mind wholly troubled, he looks for what is wrong for him rather than for medicine, that is to say, for what aggravates the disease and in a short time leads to death. When the spiritual physician sees his brother in the state described, he does not immediately cry out, nor does he take off his gown while saying to him, What you ask is wrong and deadly, and I refuse to give you this aid. On the contrary, the physician keeps him and comforts him, showing himself at once to be full of love and simplicity, so as to assure him that he will treat him and fulfill his desire with the requested remedies. There are sick men who are sorely wounded in their soul, and even though they bear such serious wounds, they only seek what aggravates the illness. Perhaps each person's disease is that where diet or abstinence regarding what is pleasing would be necessary. One seeks rather to be satisfied with unhealthful meals and to gorge oneself to satiety. For this reason, as I am about to explain, the experienced physician does not immediately consent to the patient's requests but promises to satisfy all his needs. The sick man, persuaded that this is good, pursues the object of his desires. The physician conceals his medicines. The one, quite joyful, patiently waits. The other shrewdly displays before him what indeed looks like what the patient seeks, but at heart tastes completely different and possesses an unexpected effectiveness. Hardly has the sick man touched the remedy and the first contact already has its effect on him against every hope. Simultaneously, the swelling immediately decreases, the wound completely disappears, 
and one no longer puts up with or even thinks of what desire formerly inflamed. We must behold and admire this absolutely inexplicable miracle that has transpired, solely with a thought for and recourse to medical preparations the practitioner brings the sick back to health ensures that the wounds and the swelling diminish and that the burning thirst is quenched consumed by desire for unhealthful and noxious foods the patients on the contrary now desire those which are profitable and now recount in all places the physician's miracles and the miraculous results of his art end of quote from ethical uh, treaties continue. These last cases concern primarily acute medical interventions and cannot allow us to forget that spiritual treatment on the whole demands, as we have already said, the sick person's active and permanent cooperation. This assumes that the person is properly disposed toward his spiritual father. After carefully selecting him, the spiritual child must be faithful to him. St. John Climacus writes, quote, those sick souls who try out a physician and receive help from him and then abandon him out of preference for another before they are completely healed deserve every punishment from God. This fidelity is the prerequisite for therapeutic continuity, without which the therapy cannot be effective, since the treatment permitting the acquisition of spiritual health is always long and endures every interruption. Having spelled this out, obedience appears to be the first duty of the spiritual son to his spiritual father. The apostle himself exhorts this, quote, Obey your leaders and submit to them, Hebrews 13, 17. The fathers often present obedience as a path giving direct access to spiritual healing and salvation and leading with certainty to the most advanced levels of the spiritual life, a path upon which Christ himself embarked by being obedient to his father, even to his death, on the cross. St. John Climacus speaks of the cure of obedience. Being obedient to one's spiritual father helps particularly in renouncing one's own will, which is one of the main sources of man's illnesses, being itself the source of pride. Moreover, obedience helps man acquire blessed humility, which as we shall see is one of the most basic virtues and one of the main gateways to divine grace. Thanks to obedience, man can rapidly achieve spiritual tranquility, Hezekiah, which is the total absence of anxiety regarding things of this world, and thus a, f a form of detachment vis-a-vis -vis what promotes attachment to God, as well as a state of inner peace corresponding to Hezekiah in the highest sense. We must specify that obedience must be total, it excludes all contradiction and judgment of the spiritual father whatsoever and implies that one commend oneself to him in everything. This means that one must submit to the spiritual father's judgment and will even in the tiniest, seemingly most insignificant affairs. Yet the sum of these constitute our existence and all take on importance in the context of man's relationship with God and his spiritual development. St. Anthony the Great goes so far as to say, quote, As far as possible, the monk must confess to the elders the number of steps he takes and the number of drops of water he drinks in his cell in order to know whether he deceived himself in this. All the more must the spiritual son confess each of his thoughts to his spiritual father and hide nothing of his inner life from him, but rather place all things in his hands, since the disclosing of thoughts takes on the utmost importance in the context of spiritual therapy and direction, as we shall see. Let it suffice to cite here this remark from St. John Climacus to the shepherd, quote, A physician cannot cure a sick man unless the patient first entreat him and urge him on by bearing his wounds with complete confidence. As this last comment indicates, obedience to a spiritual father is not submission to an imposing authority. Rather, it is founded on faith, on trust, and above all, love. Moreover, total respect for the freedom of their spiritual sons is a quality of authentic fathers, who propose rather than impose, and recommend rather than command, 
applying this counsel of the Holy Apostle Peter, quote, tend the flock of God that is in your charge, not by constraint but willingly, not as domineering over those in charge, but being examples to the flock. 1 Peter 5, 2-3 These fathers also know how to diminish gradually before their children to the extent that these progress towards the stature of the mature man in Christ, applying with regard to all the example of St. John, the Holy Baptist and forerunner, quote, he must increase, but I must decrease, John 3.30.